Hey, what's up, everybody? It is another Tuesday. That means another Baseball Brew Crew podcast. Ooh, this one's looking good tonight. How you doing, guys? What's up? Doing great. Doing great. Ready to rock and roll. Me, what about you? It's Let's a nice do hat. it. Let's do it. Ian's in the chat. Thank hey. you for joining us. Right on. It, it's funny because when the show starts, uh, we're the only ones in the chat, like all hyped up. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe that's 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 yes. <laughs> Let's get let's get that going. Let's 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 get everybody involved. Uh, if you're out there, let us know. Put the chat in. Tell us if you, what you like about the show. Tell us if you hate the show. You know there are non-believers out there, and guess what? We have done this every week. We are about a month and a half away from doing this. I think it's a month, maybe two months away from doing this three years straight. Are you are you serious? Yeah, are you serious? How, how do you not believe? You gotta believe. You gotta believe, people. Get behind the dream. It's fired up over there. It's fired up. Hey, fired it, up. It, it all started with a text in 2020. Exactly. And we're like, we hey, we're gonna be uh we're gonna be shut down a little bit. What, what do you want to do? I was like, oh yeah, let's do this really great thing that 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 is gonna build and build and uh well, it's, it's going to be great. We had no vision of that. But, hey, we're here every week to talk about beer and baseball, so why don't we get to it, guys? Welcome to the weekly Baseball Brew Crew podcast, keeping baseball history alive one craft beer at a time, wherever you are watching us or listening to us. Please give us a like and a follow, and if you love beer with your baseball, please tell a friend. Here is the lineup card for today. Let's do it. First, in the leadoff spot in our, is our VP of Content Development here at the Baseball Brew Crew. It is Angelo Trinidad. Welcome. Thank you for that welcome and introduction. I'm happy to be here Tuesday night, best night of the week. Say it every week, but that's because it's the 100% truth. And uh, you mentioned content development and content development I have been doing. Uh, and uh, so thank you guys for tuning in to Rip and Review the last couple of weeks uh, as uh, I vlogged my experience at the Front Row Card Show in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and uh, stay tuned for more content very similar to that coming up very soon. Right on. Those videos have done so well. Uh, the card show is, is definitely your sweet spot. So uh, we, uh, I, I'm sure there, there's so many of them now that are, that are popping up. So uh, got to get you out there. And uh, well, you have an announcement later, but uh, you might be uh, on the road doing some too. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, de definitely. Uh, definitely. A, I found my sweet spot as far as content goes, but a sore spot to the wallet, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm definitely, definitely sure about that. Next, he's the field correspondent and senior research analyst at the Baseball Brew Crew. It is Kevin Lyon on time. Loving it. Why do you always put such an emphasis on the word senior? <laughs> why, why do you do this? It's because you're 1,055 years old, Kevin. <laughs> you know, I'm not 1,055, all right? Now you're exaggerating it. You know, you're adding about... Go about 10% less. maybe. <laughs> Angelo, I've told you a million times, do not exaggerate. Yeah. He's a thousand and fifty. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish you could have said it as the voice of who you're doing that. Spot, <laughs> Told you a million times. <laughs> Do not exaggerate. <laughs> ah. I'm fired up apparently. Getting <laughs> third is the Google ambassador and the Sultan of Swig at the Baseball Brew Crew. It is Cowboy Jack Durango. He's got a microphone. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm going to drink a brew with the baseball crew. I'm going to drink till I can't no more. We're going to talk baseball with the brew crew. Kev's going to drink till he can't no more. We got Raleigh fingers, Pete Rose beer flowing like a fire hose. Disco with the baseball facts, Trinidaddy with the card packs. Kevin's going to go all rain, man. He's going to go all rain, man. Yeah, I'm going to drink a brew with the baseball crew. Woo, brothers and sisters, proud members of the baseball brew crew, Bruniverse, have no fear. It is I, the Goodwill Ambassador, the Sultan of Swig, Jackie Ball Game, Charlie Guzzle, the Hop King. Not only am I number one in fantasy baseball, Kevin, where else am I number one? That's right, your black heart. Cowboy <laughs> Jack Durango! 
Hey, what an era. Jack, Jack, I got, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I know traditionally all throughout history that cowboys ride into town on horses, but my friend, you need to be riding in on a goat because that's who you are, my friend. <laughs> that's why they yes. call me the goat. <laughs> Rock and roll tonight, boys. Let's have some fun. Wow, that is awesome. All that. I mean, can we just, just turn it off. Let's we'll go home. You know. yeah, thank you guys for tuning in to episode yeah, 127. Yeah, it's been a fun show right, yeah. <laughs> so far. So far. All right. My name is Michael Mondragon. I'll be your humble host for this festivities tonight. As tradition on the show, we always bring a new and unique craft beer to review and enjoy. So what are you drinking tonight? I'm going to start with Angelo. All right. To continue my uh, installment of highlighting black owned breweries in honor of black history month here in the month of February, I'm going to talk about 18th street brewery in Gary, Indiana. So 18th street brewery in Gary, Indiana was uh, founded by drew Fox uh, who took a trip to Belgium uh, in 2008 and sparked his interest in brewing beer from his home. So um, the, he created a Kickstarter campaign to raise money. Um, and that's how his uh, beer was able to, um, or his company was able to grow uh, to where it is today. So I actually pulled up his uh, Kickstarter uh, goal, and he um, actually was able to fund 24000 of a $12,000 goal to move the home brewing uh, out of his home and into an actual brewery, um, again, located in Gary, Indiana. And actually, oddly enough, um, the brewery is not on 18th Street, as this is an homage to a street in his hometown of Chicago, Illinois. So they have um, a brewery and tap room in Gary uh, that serves all their uh, brew on tap, as well as um, uh, a nice menu of food available. And um, I wanted to highlight a couple of their flagship beers as uh, Michael had up on the screen there, the, their uh, base best patio pills um, and their candy crushable a pale ale with lactose sugar added with Simcoe, Falconer's Flight, and Warrior Hops. Um, and they have a really, really nice uh, menu of brews available. The Hunter, which is brewed with cocoa nibs and lactose. It's their double milk stout. They have a double IPA with grapefruit zest added called the Rise of the Angels. Uh, but yeah, so I wanted to highlight 18th Street Brewery out of Gary, Indiana, and Drew Fox, uh, who founded it. And again, um, very similar to the show where this show started with the text, this, his dream and owning and operating a brewery started uh, with a vacation to Belgium. So very cool. Very cool. I, I, I had not heard of this one. And then uh, you said Gary, Indiana, uh, Kevin, uh, home to who? The Jacksons. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and also the independent baseball team. When I say, Oh, is it the Gary? Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to remember this. Rail shore. Uh, is it, you know, was it the, South Shore Railcats or something yeah, like that? So, that's, yeah. right. that's what it was. That's yeah, that's what it was. An independent team, right? It's in the same league as the uh, Chicago Dogs. You know, I, I think it's the same. That's league. right. That's right. Just, fun stuff. And also, yeah. I saw that they actually have a tap room in Indianapolis too, as well. So. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, we go. Go ahead. Nope, that's it. All right. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. Next up, Kevin. This is a cool one. Yeah. And I remember seeing this can a few months ago and then a friend of the show, Steve gave me this. I've been sitting on this. So it's called pale from the crypt. It's by a brewery called liquid gravity brewing company. And they're in uh, San Luis Obispo, which is, you know, like about like two and a half hours North of LA or so. So this is really interesting too, because um, this actually is officially licensed with the tales from the crypt comic book. So that's why I was really surprised. I go, oh, that's a cool homage. I'm like, nope, it's actually a real one. So Pale from the Crypt is a big, bold, unapologetic West Coast Pale Ale. It boasts a robust aroma of peaches, tangerines, and passion fruit. A backbone of two-row barley, caramel, malt, and torrified wheat act to balance the beer for a frighteningly satisfying experience. I need this knocked over, but besides the point. So uh, I see a quote here. We are extremely excited to join forces with EC Comics on this project. So EC Comics is the ones behind this. Their brand and legacy as a creative force are inspiring, and we are honored to have the opportunity to work with them. From uh, uh, Brendan Go, from the owner and brewer of Liquid Gravity, and so this is the first officially licensed beer for EC Comics, 
And Tales from the Crypt will feature iconic cover art from the original Tales from the Crypt comic books, as well as original art created by an artist named Toby Newell. You'll find familiar faces such as the only man who might be older than me that I know of, the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> you probably recognize him from the Tales from the Crypt uh, TV show. That's what most of you probably would know this from. Uh, along with the Old Witch and Vault Keeper, along with the new Hot Witch, Brewmeister, and Malt Keeper. I don't know if you ha- uh, can get a want to solo me on this. I don't know if you're, hopefully you get a good shot here. But see, there's those new characters. And I'm guessing it's people from the actual brewery. Oh, very so cool. They gave this original artwork with this. So so it's like the Brewmeister. Yeah, the Hop Witch in the middle. And then on the bottom was the uh, the Malt Keeper. I'm like, so they made their own little characters for this. But I thought it was a nice little touch, too. And uh, and the gra- and the, and the, uh, they had the binder and the guy's going, Quickly! Lift out his coffin. He doesn't belong in our sacred graveyard. He desiccates the very ground in which he's buried. <laughs> so I, I'm sure I'm, I, that was me yelling that, by the way. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that's me being an homage to me. So uh, for the first release in this in this partnership, it actually uh, is, I want to make sure I have the right one. So this has actually been out for a while. This is cover art from the uh, 1951 Tales from the Crypt, February, March issue. So actually this is not, this might be a later release. So they keep releasing this with different artwork and different of the comic books. This one's from uh, issue number 26 from October 1951. So it's pretty cool with the label art and they just put the little touch on it. So in the very list, it's been going on since January of 2021. So it's cool. So I'm like, I, so I'm like that's a fun thing to see in officially licensed comic book. I'm like, that's a cool little touch for those who knows Tales of the Crypt. And look at them too. I was having fun looking at some of their beers. Um, they have a couple of fun names on paper. One of them I can't even say on the air because it literally says F, the actual F word, money, get hops. I'd be like, all right, I'm down with that <laughs> West Coast IPA. Uh, and they had a they had a uh, hazy IPA called Panic at the beer aisle. So I was like, oh, that's that's kind of fun too. And on our back, thank this guy. I'm like, all right, I can support that, you know. And they also even made like a even have a hazy orange creamsicle uh double ipa which i'm like whoa that sounds kind of crazy so i ever see that one called the orange cream machine i may have to have that but yeah this is a nice nice beer just nice chill out beer i didn't even get through the numbers on this it's definitely like morning beer for me i'm sure being a pale ale it comes in at 5.5 percent abv uh 45 ibu so i only have one of these jacks so i'm sorry i'm not gonna be that fired up tonight (laughs) <laughs> just just do some sipskis brother do some sipskis as a wise man once told me life in moderation that's the key oh i know okay. i'm sure i told you that <laughs> that wasn't you dude that wasn't oh, you. I, <laughs> um yeah this is super cool I, and boy you know the deeper we get into beers it's so cool because there's all these like layers of of a thing like i i haven't uh let's see Liquid Gravity. I I think yeah. I've heard of it. I've probably yeah. seen a couple beers by it, but then you know, when we always dive in deeper uh, to the all these breweries, um, it's so cool to to see how like pop culture. It's exactly like it's probably why we do the show. You know, it's like yeah. pop culture. Um, you know, they're all baseball fans, and and uh, yeah. there's always something like this. And then you know, the comic book thing. I mean, like Unsung. If you ever uh, the one over by where Kevin uh, lives is, um, is, is a super comic book. And then there's a lot. Oh, what was the other um, game craft is another yeah, game video game one. Uh, yeah. I went there yesterday. They actually had a, a new beer called ratchet and gank named after the ratchet and clank game, which I thought was. A oh, see, time. there you go. So, so they that, do a little fun video game stuff like that, but, but this is like a brewery I never even heard of. And now they somehow had were were, were creative enough to say, Hey, you know, but, I don't know who would have reached out first, but to actually get this officially licensed, that's cool. That's, a that's amazing. That's super cool. Thank you for sharing that one. Next uh-huh. up is Cowboy Jack Durango with one that actually uh, I had recently. Uh, it was a collab, I believe. Yeah. So the shop beer company opened its doors in August of 2016 and has been drenching Arizona in its delicious craft beer ever since. The shop was born from the ashes of, get this, a closed coffee shop named the Cartel Coffee Lab. And much like the name of my lovely city, it rose from the ashes like a phoenix. 
This homegrown Arizona powerhouse converted a residential home in downtown Tempe into their tap room. And interestingly enough, the home was the residence of former mayor of Tempe and member of the U.S. House of Representatives, Harry Mitchell. They took the name The Shop in honor of the hardworking craftsmen out there who often use the term, I'm headed to the shop, I'm headed back from the shop. So they wanted to get it out there for the working man. So they called it The Shop. Their main selling point, other than their top shelf beer skis, is a taproom patio. The layout and decor gives you the feeling of a badass backyard barbecue at a close friend's house. So Bruniverse, if you're lucky enough to find yourself in the Tempe area and you're powerful thirsty, might I recommend sampling their Supreme Dream Cocktail IPA with apricot, passion fruit, and coconut. Have you ever heard of a cocktail IPA? I no. You haven't. I haven't either. This is the first that I've ever heard about it. It's a hazy IPA IPA base, and then they just throw fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit, and they make what they call a cocktail IPA to hit you with that nice IPA hoppiness that we like, but also some dramatic fruit flavors, and it's going to keep you coming back for more. So don't forget to tell them when you stop in that the Valley of the Sun's favorite son, Cowboy Jack Durango, sent you. Nice. Oh, no. Nice. I, I'm, I'm liking uh, everything I'm seeing from this from this brewery. Uh, I definitely, this is one that shot to the top of the list when I had the, I, I think I had a collab uh, last time. I think it was potentially with Ren house. I, I, I have to look again, but, um, uh, but yeah, this is, this one looks super cool. Uh, I think in that area. So in Tempe, I'm trying to think, okay, so there is, um, so, so Tempe, I, I have, I have a really, uh, my, my, my young, younger days, I was, that's where I kind of grew up and, you know, like at a, at a high school and, and into, into what I should have been going to college, but I didn't go to college, but in, in Tempe is, a, a, is Arizona state university. So just South of there, there's like a, there's railroad tracks. And right there is a place that uh, was called the sun club. Now the sun club with a, like this little punk club and uh, like Nirvana played there. I think like, um, uh oh god this uh, just name every like 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 punk band underground band that they would have played there you know but like nirvana in their very early 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 days uh played there but we used to go see the uh, see the bands there well right down if we were i, I went down there i was like oh i, I see if the sun club is still there it's not that it, i thought it was going to be there i was like you know i knew that it had had left but but right down the street was uh four peaks is where four peaks started so they took all that industrial area and then they just kind of made stuff. So I'm wondering if they might have they, they said it took over a residential area. Yeah, it was a home. It's a it's oh. a residential home. It was it was the the residence of uh, the former mayor of Tempe, man. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. I have to definitely have to check that out. But it, yeah, that that area has like a lot of history. So I'm wondering where exactly it is. Uh, so. I will text you the exact cross street. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Well, my beer for tonight is a collab uh, between uh, Tarantula Hill Brewing Company in Thousand Oaks, California, and Beechwood Brewing called the Day Trek IPA. Uh, Beechwood Brewing is uh, from Long Beach, California. It's one of my favorites, and Tarantula Hill has been popping up a lot more. We had, that, I think it was called Liquid Candy. Right. Kevin? I had that last year and I know yeah. I don't I don't remember. I think you had that. One I think I just well. had it recently like on your own. Right. On your own. Outside yeah. Your own. So the Day Trek IPA is a 7.1 ABV, no IBU listed. Uh, this West Coast IPA collab with our friends at Beachwood is loaded with aromatic neck, uh, nectaron, uh, citra and El Dorado hops. Uh, this one was brewed at the Tarantula Hill um, brewery, I guess. Obviously, the other one was at Beachwood. Uh, I guess it's another version of this. Um, that's what I'm liking is is now that that these uh, beers are being uh, collaborated with, and you get the best of both worlds. We get to learn about like I love Beachwood, so I trust any cl collab that they do. Um, this one is like uh, off the nose. Oh my god, super hoppy! Like I, I can already tell I'm gonna love this beer. It's got that West Coast hoppy uh, profile. If you can see it right there, it's not too not too cloudy. It's it's pretty um, pretty golden. 
Super good. I mean, like it's a winner if it's an West Coast IPA for me. So this uh, Beechwood, I know what I'm going to get. Um, really good, smooth, uh, great profile in the hops. And uh, yeah, I've never heard of uh, Nectaron uh, hops, uh, but I've had Citra and Eldorado, a good mix. So yeah. So um, if you see this one, the Day Trek IPA, definitely uh, pick this one up. This is uh, worth a try if you like West Coast IPAs. Um, yes. Uh, Ian said, when, so when I go to the shop, I'm asking for a cocktail. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I saw that they, they had a whole bunch of, uh, uh, cocktails and I think I didn't know how they, how they mix that in as well. Yeah, no. And I think their big winner is the, uh, the church music IPA, which That's I know you I had, I had the church yes. music. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That was, that was tremendous. Tremendous. All right. So let's do it. This is This Day in Baseball History for February 21st. February 21st, 1966, Emmett Ashford becomes the first black to be a major league umpire when the American League hires him. Known for his flashy style in the Pacific Coast League, he will spend five years in the big leagues, working in the 1967 All-Star Game and the 1970 World Series before reaching the mandatory retirement age of 56. Oh, my gosh. Oh, now, wait a second. Wow. Yeah. Wait, wait. There was a That's mandatory uh, retirement age of fifty six. Uh, I don't think that's a, that's any a, anymore. Uh, this is this is Joe West, uh, the C Cowboy Joe, uh, known for his. Um, or it, well, he was he set a major league baseball record by umpiring five thousand four hundred and sixty regular season games. Um, he he retired at sixty nine. Wow. Well, and still in great shape. I mean, Diesel <laughs> just jacked, bro. I, 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 I want to get his upper body routine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, I will say that he's not the worst hated umpire, but he was. He was definitely up there. Uh, they called him Cowboy Joe for for a reason. He was. He's definitely a maverick. Um, but uh, the thing that I didn't know was that he um, designed his own chest protector um, and. Uh, he also recorded two country music albums. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we may have to do a we may have to do a music review Sim simultaneously. <laughs> that was left out. He was yeah. in the booth, <laughs> um, <laughs> chest protector, while recording yeah. his albums. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he can I mean, use that. I mean, as Cowboy Jack mentioned, look at that physique. Yes. So it took two two al recording of two albums to. Get a chest protector to cover that chisel. <laughs> I'm hoping he can use that chest protector as like a kind of like a washboard as an extra instrument too when he's, when he's playing. <laughs> That'd be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, that's good. So so yeah, 56. I guess I I tried to look it up like when the the mandatory retirement age ended. And I, I I didn't see anything, but I thought. Huh. Um, it was cool that, that that even was a, even a thing at one point. Dude, all the good good old days when there was an actual retirement age, not like today when it's like, nah, you can work till you're ninety. Keep going. <laughs> I, I can. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> well, ninety. Yeah, that was like a century ago. How old was I this week? I can't keep February twenty first, nineteen seventy four. Tom Seaver becomes the highest paid pitcher in baseball history when he signs a one year contract for one hundred and seventy two thousand dollars, a twenty five percent increase from the last season to hurl for the Mets. The twenty nine year old right hander, known as Tom Terrific, uh, has posted a one hundred and thirty five and seventy six record during his seven years in New York. Now I looked it up, so. In seventy, Wait, did you say he was one thirty five and one seventy six? No, one thirty five and seventy six. Oh, seventy six. Sorry, I was yeah. like, wait a minute, he had a losing record. I mean, the best no, no, no. years, but no, I was like, wait no, he had a great record. Yeah, I was like, so wait. I looked it up, and so in seventy three, um, he was nineteen and ten uh, with a two point zero eight ERA, eighteen complete games, and won the Cy Young. Okay, they were in the World Series that year, right? They were. They were. And they and they they lost. Them. Yeah. Then uh, in seventy four, so he gets he gets this twenty five percent increase, right? 
-hmm. He goes 11 and 11 with a 3.20 ERA. Still has 201 uh, uh, strikeouts. He had 251 the the uh, previous year. But then in 75, he went 22 and 9 with a 2.38 ERA and 243 strikeouts. So that was actually when he got his pay increase, he actually had his uh, his arguably his worst year. (laughs) The old, hey, you got to play. And the contract year, you got to step it up, brother. Yes. The, <laughs> the, you just relax a little bit, you know? Yes, exactly. So, I mean, what did you say his ERA was in 74? Uh, 3.20. Oh, my gosh. That tells you how bad the Mets must have been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know I, mean? yeah. I, mean, the, I mean, they made the World Series, but that next year. No, no, no. You, you said 74. Uh, 73, it was 2.08. I was at but the, the year he went eleven and eleven is I was just curious what his ERA yeah. was because yeah, he, he was you know you yeah. hear that ERA and you're like oh my god how could this guy be an eleven and eleven so he wasn't getting much true much true yeah in seventy four there I was obviously did weren't as good all right yeah salary comes up again uh, here so uh, we'll definitely make mention of it February twenty first. 1980, Billy Martin signs a two-year, $250,000 deal to be the A's manager, becoming Charlie Finley's 15th different manager in the past 20 years. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, that's that's worse than, than good old Georgie Steinbrenner, Cowboy Jack. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> did did, uh, did Billy Martin make it through the two-year contract? Did he see yeah, it all the way yeah, through? Yeah. Uh, I believe that he did. Um, but this was the, so during the three year reign of Billy Ball, the fiery 51 year old skipper will compile a 215 and 218 record, winning a division title as the first half leader of the 1981 strike shortened season in the AL West. I forgot, I always forget about 81 was a strike shortened season. Yeah. 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 But, uh, just hashtag the research here if I can get there. Is that I was trying to figure who that is on the right. I was I don't know if it, I think it's that, oh I think gosh, it's catfish, but I don't think it's catfish. No, I don't think it is. I think it's I, I want to say like it's not Dave McKay, but it's uh shoot. It's it might gosh, am I might, it might I even be picture, but I can't recall. Yeah, but I, but I love how ooh, this player do you look at his look at his hand, Jack. You it's almost like he's got a blade in one of those finger tapes. Yeah, he's giving <laughs> he's giving. You know, like, why is he got his fingertips, you know, the fingers all taped up? Like, all right, well, <laughs> you got to have it. Hey, Caitlin, thanks for joining. All right. So the, no, you're going to like this one. You're gonna, You guys are all going to love this one. This is this is fun one. February 21st, 1986, in defiance of the Reds policy, Raleigh Fingers refuses to cut off his trademark handlebar mustache and retires from baseball. The future Hall of Fame reliever who leaves the game with 341 saves had been offered a contract by Cincinnati skipper Pete Rose after being released by the Brewers at the end of last season. So I looked up his 85 season. He was 38 years old. Um, The Milwaukee Brewers at that time were in the uh, American League. So um, much, much tougher um, division uh, at that time. Um, he was one in six with a 5.04 ERA, 17 saves. And, um, in, and uh, again, uh, Pete Rose gambled on uh, bringing Raleigh Fingers back and it kind of backfired because they, they I think they were one of two, two teams that had uh, uh, facial hair policies. Yeah. <clears throat> No, no, what's super interesting about this is the uh, Cincinnati GM, the guy's name was Bill Burgish, had a phone call with Raleigh Fingers like, hey, are you going to shave it off? And Raleigh's like, no, nah, not going to happen. And he's like, well, I guess uh, guess you're not coming to work here. And he's like, I guess I'm not. See you later. <laughs> like that. That's like that's commitment to a stash, brother. Yes. Like, but he knew his gimmick, and I mean, he was kind of on the tail end of his career. So, I, hey, way to go! Way to go out on your own terms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that he missed the eighty. I think it's the eighty-four season potentially with the whole season with an injury. Yeah, it was um, a back injury. Yeah, so he, so he was, he had a not a bad year before that, but um, but yeah, I think that he knew he was done at, at that time and kind of went with it. So, um, 
I believe 83, he tore some muscles in his forearm and missed some games. And then 84, he had a back injury that kept him out for most of the season. So he, he knew there wasn't a lot of gas in the tank. So uh, he stood his ground and he, uh, he, he said, you know, said, let, say la vie to the world's greatest baseball's greatest manager, Pete Rose. Yes. And yes. Uh, so, yeah, that dream team never came to be, sadly. So, so, Jack, what do you think was uh, Marge Schott's conversation with that GM? I mean, I say, hey, we might bring in Raleigh. What do you think Marge <laughs> said to <laughs> – uh, Probably too many expletives, so let's clean it up. He better shave off the effing stash. <laughs> that, I, I was, that was a good Marge Schott. I just like her. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I do a really good Marge Schott. Right. <laughs> so, um, by the way, you bring up Marge Schott. That is, uh, that's a little bit of foreshadowing. So remember that. So 1985, uh, when we were just talking about the one and six season was Raleigh's first and only $1 million contract year. Wow. He never, if you look at his, even when he was, uh, with all those, uh, Padres teams, like he made $1.6 million in like six years with the Padres as a combined. Huh. Yeah, and then, I mean, it, the million dollar player really started happening more around this era, you know. Because I, mean? I think it was like a couple of years later, it was like I think Kirby Puckett signed like a deal where he was making like three or four million dollars a year, and people were like flipping out back then. They're saying, Oh, these players are making too much money, yeah. <laughs> now we have a player making 10 times that much in a season, you know. Yeah, I remember going to a uh Cleveland Indians, uh, Milwaukee Brewers spring training game, I think it was like 85. And we're as we were leaving uh, after the game, the the some of the players were still doing like wind sprints and stuff like that. And I remember at the time, like Brett Butler uh, signed like a million dollar contract, and like people from the Indians were so mad that that it, it, they're like, you don't deserve a million dollars. So I mean, the, the the fans of their own team like hate it. <laughs> like, they're giving them such grief, yeah, right. and now it's like it's such a bargain. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'm sorry they offered it to me. What was I say? No. Come on. Ke yeah. Kevin, who who was the first player to get a million dollar contract? Oh shoot! Do I remember? Let me think about this. Why well, was I thinking Joe DiMaggio? But I might be off on that. Uh oh! Shook your head. No. Go, go, Jack. Go, Jack. Nolan Ryan. Oh gosh. The, get Nolan Ryan had the first million dollar contract in baseball. Are you saying like a million dollars a year? Is that what you mean by that? Correct, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. That's, uh, all right. All right. Now you know what you're saying. Sorry. Back <laughs> in like those days, like guys making like a couple hundred thousand dollars and it was like, <gasps> make so yeah, much right. money. Yeah. He's a million dollar man. Man, look at that. Cowboy <laughs> Jack's on fire with the trip. <laughs> all right. So let's keep the Pete Rose uh, talk going. Oh That's right. Uh -oh. February 21st, 1989, Reds manager Pete Rose meets with Commissioner Peter Uberoff and Commissioner-elect Bart Giamatti to explain the allegations concerning his gambling habits. Major League Baseball will launch a full investigation into the matter next month, which will lead to Charlie Hustle's permanent ban from the game in August. So uh, this is where it started, and it, it definitely didn't this end here. first meeting. Yeah, this is yep. what led to the Dowd report. So let's keep the Reds talk going. February 21st, 2000, denying the acquisition of Ken Griffey Jr. as the reason, the Reds announced the team has dropped its uh, prohibition on earrings. Players have worn the jewelry in the Cincinnati clubhouse but weren't allowed to take uh, to the field wearing uh, earrings or any jewelry. So who do you think enforced this rule? You gotta got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I, is, there, is there cigarette and her dog? Yes. Where's Shotzi? Yes. Marge, Marge Shot looks like she smells like whiskey feet and cigarettes. Just look <laughs> at her. So... So we're talking February uh, 21st, 2000. So on April 20th, 1999, Schott agreed to sell her controlling interest in the Reds for $67 million to a group led by Cincinnati businessman Carl Linder. Uh, 
And <laughs> shocking, at the time, she was facing her third suspension, failing health, and expiring ownership agreement with her limited partners who planned to oust her. Shot remained a, a minority partner uh, still after this. So uh, this is kind of amazing. So I'm sure she, she was, uh, she's on her deathbed going, oh, he's wearing an earring on the yeah. field. How dare he? <laughs> so, so what's so crazy about like Cincinnati's, the, the ball club's moratorium on jewelry, facial hair, this clean shaven look that they, they forced their players to have their original mascot had a handlebar mustache. Uh, I think he was called the Cincinnati Red Legs Man or something like that. And they redid the the little mascot to be no mustache, to be a clean-shaven mascot. Oh, it's so like, weak. Like, give me a break. This is what we were worried about back then. We're worried about mustaches when Pete Rose can't even get in the Hall of Fame. Come on, Cincinnati. You know what Come on, baseball. Up? You know what that reminds me of? Uh, they took, uh, remember the Pep Boys logo? Mm -hmm. There was one guy with with a, a cigar, and they took it out. To right. be, uh, for, I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? <laughs> oh, so crazy. So crazy. Can't even have fun anymore, guys. Yes. That's it. Yes. Oh my God. This is, I don't know. There, there, there's so many, we talk about it all the time. Like how, how can baseball like go forward when it's, it's stuck in its past? Stuck in um, the past so and bad. then they just make it, you know, that even the rules that they do make are just don't make sense. In fact, I even heard, you know, that we, they talk about the ghost runner. They say mm -hmm. like, they polled fans and nobody wants the ghost runner in extra innings. Except for like um, uh, Manfred, uh, the commissioner of baseball, and then someone called it Manfred's man. Like I, I love that. <laughs> that's <laughs> for those of you uh, fans of the uh, Manfred man is Earth band. Uh, they I got a chuckle out of that. But see this this is the, this is the problem uh, with baseball being a mono a monopoly and not being subject to antitrust laws. They don't have to listen. There's no competition. They can do whatever they want, boys. Yeah. So thanks a lot, crooked, uh, crooked uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to make. I don't. I also want to make mention of the uh, the the stalker back there in, in the yes. Mets. I right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, it, it's it's nice seeing Kevin back there plotting <laughs> <laughs> plotting his next victim, dude. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, Marge is walking down the street going, do I did it, did it, did it, do That's just for you, Michael. You want some man you. for man, there it is. Oh, that's awesome. Thank walking you. Walking down the street, smoking her cigarette, <laughs> singing, do I did it, did it, do did it, do Oh, fantastic. Why, we, we go deep. We, the references are deep. You got to, uh, no way can keep up with us. All right. So, uh, here is one of my favorite. Kevin, do you want to do the introduction? Uh-oh. It's time for Rip and Review with Angelo Trinidad. <laughs> Best intro ever. I love it. All right. So Kevin asked me earlier this week for this installment of Rip and Review if I'm going to be opening up some uh, new Tops product as a uh, 2023 Tops was uh, released last week, and the answer is no, because I will be opening that this weekend on Saturday's uh, video of Rip and Review. However, this evening I will be opening up a unique product that I think you guys are all gonna love and enjoy, and that is 2022 Tops Baseball Mini. <laughs> all right, Mini. Mini. So, <laughs> 2020 was the last time that they made. Yeah, 2020 was the last year that they made Tops Baseball Mini, and this is a mini version of all three sets of Tops flagship baseball. Uh, so that Series One, Series Two, and Update Series. So that means that this is a 990 base card set. Wow. And uh, unfortunately, we're only going to get 35 in here uh, because apparently the, the cards are smaller, but also the boxes. So, um, <laughs> so, so just to just to clarify, they're not mini cards. They are mini cards. Oh, they're mini cards. And I have a full size tops uh, card from last season to show the, uh, the scale, uh, the size, okay. yeah, the size scale comparison. So, do we so, so we're going to find 35 cards per box. 
including two inserts and three parallels. So the three parallels are um, short printed. Some of them are numbered as low as 25 to 100. So, um, but yeah, so this was an online exclusive. So ho hopefully you guys enjoyed this rip. So we're going to see all the top rookies from 2022, Wander Franco, Julio Rodriguez, Bobby Witt Jr., um, Spencer Torkelson, um, and all the current stars as well. So uh, I'm excited to, to get this one going. So shall we, boys? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Let's get to ripping. Rip <laughs> all right. So I've been holding on to this for a while because I wanted to save this for, uh, for a live show. But there's our singular pack of 35 cards. Okay, so is this considered a blast, or is this every box like this? Every box is like this. So it was a Tops.com exclusive online. Um, so, and uh, if you remember, the 2022 Tops uh, series had the 87 throwback cards. Yes. So that is also the case here. There will be 87 throwbacks. So here is what the card looks like. We got Christian Javier, and then here's the back. And it shows here number 211 of the mini set. Here is a full size Julio Rodriguez card. So you can see the comparison there. There you go. Yeah. So it's a little bit okay. smaller. All right. But uh, yeah, so definitely an interesting and unique product. Then we have uh, Carson Kelly. There hey. we go. There you go. Shohei Otani for the PC. We got Fernando Tatis Jr. Good start here. Jorge Alfaro, Jose Barrios. We have a our first uh, color um, parallel. Hopefully, it's numbered. So this is going to be a red Freddie Peralta. Get your beers ready. There and this go. one is going to be two Ooh. of five. That's cool. Wow! Wow! Right on. We got uh, Yadier Molina, Ian Kennedy. Strong style Ian Kennedy. Kennedy. <laughs> Kyle Schwarber. We have a pink. This is our next uh, uh, parallel. Uh, Kyle Muller rookie card pink. This one is numbered 12 of 25. So Ooh. two low numbered uh, parallels. So, nice. so far, so good. Uh, okay. So um, this is from Update Series. So you see Kyle, or this one maybe is from update. So we have Kyle oh. Schwarber on the Red Sox oh, and so Kyle funny. Schwarber on the Phillies. Oh, that's great. <laughs> wow. Right on. All right. We got Tim Locastro. Oh, what a great picture, too. Yeah. Uh, Jerry's Familia. Willie Peralta. Alex Cobb. Just, he's putting out the vibe in that one, boys. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shogo Akiyama. I've been very happy to get that catch. Good job. Chris Bubik. Lamonte Wade Jr. Shout out Ian. Gary Sanchez. That's a fake Alex, name. Alex Sounds like a jobber Fado. from WWF. Gary <laughs> Sanchez. <laughs> we had a rookie of Alex Fado. Fado. Rookie of Anderson Severino. Simon Muzzotti rookie. A lot of rookies in this back. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Rookie of Seiya Suzuki. That's yeah. another Ooh, good one. That's there. a good one. Rookie of Bo Brisky. Sounds like a barbecue. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Clint Frazier. Tyler Wade. We got Josh Harrison. We have our uh, next parallel, Nick Senzel. This one is numbered to 10. Woo! So I got a five, a wow. ten, and a twenty-five. So nice. I got all the the low numbered ones. Hey, we have an Angels team card with Trout and Otani. Royce Lewis rookie card. We had another show. Yeah. Hey, hundred career home runs. This is a good box. And there the you PC go. is the uh, PC oh. is happy. One last dance. Cool. Albert Gaudier and uh, who is that? Um, yeah, uh, Wainwright. Who's that, who's that with him? Is that Wainwright? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, nice. Eighty-seven. Right. Oh, get your beers get ready. Your beers get ready. your beers ready. Yowza! And then the last card of the box. Oh, oh yeah. I, that. Yeah. I wish I did. 
But Ken, I can't believe that Ken, happened. Ken, right on. That is I'm awesome. Here. That. Angel, you know, your favorite player of all time. Dude. My favorite player of all time. Right the on. last card in the pack. Favorite last player of all time, bro. And those that are, is so I'm, awesome. What's that, Kevin? Oh, oh, oh no, oh, we oh. can't hear him. I don't know what happened. My mic like went out or something. Go. You're good. You're back. Oh, my mic, I don't know. I don't know what happened. My mic's like off or something. <laughs> that was weird. Man, what a way to end it out. We got a few Shohei cards. We got the uh, Freddie Peralta out of five. We got the Nick Senzel to 10. And then we got the Kyle Moeller to 25. Wow. What a bother. The, the PC is happy tonight, huh? Yes, sir. That's, so there you have it. That's top, 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 2022 Tops Mini. What a fun rip. Um, actually, these cards weren't as many as I thought they were going to be. I was going to, I was thinking like the mini tobacco cards, like in Allen and Ginter. Uh, but yeah, these are pretty cool though. So again, here's uh, the scale comparison to the full size card. So just a little bit smaller. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, what a fun rip. Totally. So I remember that was, that was, was, that was that's awesome. I, I remember there was, um, I think it was 1975. They had a set. I think they were even smaller than these cards. Yeah. Um, but I, these actual ones are actually bigger than I expected. Uh, yeah, but yeah, too. I was thinking of there were like the little yeah. little cards they have uh, before. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, Ian enjoyed it. So that that's 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 great. Yeah, it was totally. Yeah, he, he need he needs to get a box of those for uh, for his wife Nikki. Yep. A nice little oh, yeah. new baby That'd present. What, um, how much did it cost? So the, when those were on sale on tops.com, they went on sale for $19.99. Um, those sold out pretty quickly, just like they do with the, the 582 Montgomery Club. Um, so I got this on the secondary market on eBay. So I paid about $60 for that box. So, oh, wow. Okay. So, but I mean, this was released, um, you know, this was released like six, seven months ago. So or whenever, it was shortly after Tops Update Series was released. So... There's um, still some floating out there, probably a little bit cheaper now that it's in the off season. I've actually been hanging on to this for a while. So, so Angelo, are you watching like tops.com and are you watching these card manufacturers websites for these releases? And is there a big market of just grabbing them right away? Are you on a waiting list? Uh, how does that work? Yeah. So it's a great question. So yeah, there's um, the, the release dates are listed far in advance. I usually go off of um, Beckett's um, website or um, cardboardconnection.com uh, for the latest releases. Um, and then I'll usually, you know, um, either I'll get it, the, whoever has the best price. And it's usually either my LCS or eBay is probably my go-to. I try to, I mean, I do like, you know, Steel City collectibles and stuff like that, but with the shipping costs, it's can get a little bit of expensive. Um, but uh, I also try to stick to like the retail product as well, because it's much more affordable. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I keep, keep track of all the releases and that kind of helps me plan out uh, my weekly rip and review videos. So I have some product uh, stashed for a couple videos and there's a couple releases coming up. A uh, Panini Prism draft pick space wall just came out. So I'll be opening that up soon here in a couple weeks. Uh, Panini Elite Extra Edition will be releasing this week, so I'll be opening that up in a couple weeks as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I try to keep up with the release dates and make sure I have a, enough um, product to open uh, for both this segment on the live show and as well as the the weekend videos. So that's why it's cool when I can sprinkle in the card show videos and stuff because um, it kind of breaks up the monotony of the content as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, I always have trouble. Um like getting things on tops.com because you know, usually it, it's listed on there, but it usually says sold out. Or if there is something I'm going to go, Oh, let me go get my, uh, let me get my credit card. I come back and it's like sold out or whatever. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty, yeah. it, it yeah, messy. I very, I very, yeah, I, yeah, I very rarely purchase stuff on, um, on tops website. I maybe I purchased uh, a couple years ago. They had the tops, um, and Steve Aoki, um, collaboration sets mm -hmm. so i got that um and i bought in a couple things on panini's website and had a little bit more success there because they do their new releases in the dutch auction style so it'll start off at a certain price and the price will drop until everything sells out 
Um, but yeah, I, I rarely use Panini and Tops directly. So got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. You get kind of, you have to be kind of like in the know on things, uh, to get, to get things, which I don't know if it hurts or helps. Um, you know, but you, it's, it's always one of those things and it's actually, it's gotten harder than like in the last couple of years. Uh, to do, it used to be a lot easier. Sure. I remember, but now it's, uh, you know, things have gotten popular. <laughs> So no, yeah, no, I, I, I know very little about uh, cards and packs and you know all that. My son is getting very interested in, in basketball cards, and local retailers have stopped carrying packs of cards because fights were happening yeah. when they would stock the shelves. So, so like like the Target, the Walmart, the local retail stores have just stopped selling them. So, yeah, it's a wild, wild uh, hobby. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think Target Target.com is. I've had the most success on Target.com. I know um, Ian uh, buys off Target.com a lot too, just because they've they've kind of shifted to go online uh, based on you know what you were talking about with those fights and stuff. Um, So yeah, and there's there's plenty of basketball um, on uh, Target.com right now too. um, Jack. So check out. Yeah. And it's like it's retail, so it's cheaper, better than buying a two hundred dollar hobby box. You get yourself a thirty dollar blaster. But, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Got it. Well, thanks for the advice. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah, uh, I'd like to end out uh, our show with um, a rest in power, um, and it's for Tim McCarver. Uh, for those, uh, a lot of people these days know uh, Tim McCarver as a uh, announcer, broadcaster, and uh, actually he was a pretty decent um, uh, catcher. Uh, for the St. Louis Cardinals, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Montreal Expos. He uh, spent some time with the uh, Red Sox as well. He actually uh, was three times with the uh, Cardinals from 59 to 61, 63 to 69, and from 73 to 74. Uh, he used to be uh, Bob Gibson's catcher. And also uh, when he was with uh, Philadelphia, he was Steve Carlton's um, catcher as well. Actually, Steve Carlton was also on, on the Cardinals as well uh, during one of his stints. He was a two-time All-Star, uh, 67 and six, uh, 66 and 67, two-time World Series champion. Uh, he's in the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame. Um, he When he was with the Phillies, he actually caught uh, Rick Wise's no-hitter in uh, 1971. He also had a, uh, he caught Bill Stoneman's second uh, cr- of, of two career uh, no hitter. So he actually was, he's pretty solid catcher. Didn't have quite the numbers. Um, he was a 271 lifetime hitter, only 97 home runs, 645 um, runs batted in. He actually, uh, he, I was telling you that he won two championships. He actually ended, um, 1980 he actually uh, played a few games at the beginning of the season for the Phillies um and he would have won a third championship but he he just he didn't play that that long enough to to get that uh credit but he actually right after that started broadcasting uh became a broadcaster for ABC with Don Drysdale uh did Monday night baseball um and then you know did his first world series in 85 as a last minute replacement for Howard Cosell so, yeah, so he, he's, uh, and actually, um, does he actually had, um, some controversial moments too. Uh, does anybody know any of his controversial moments? I do not. He was actually very critical of Deion Sanders playing, uh, oh. when he was, remember we talked about when he was going to yeah. play baseball, uh, uh, he was going to uh, play a football game, but then come to the, uh, the playoff game. He was actually very critical of that. When the, when the Braves advanced, um, he actually poured water all over McCarver uh, in the in the locker room and stuff like that. So it's like it was, wow. yeah. And uh, you know, he had some other controversial moments. I I loved Tim McCarver. I thought he was um, a a really a great bro- broadcaster. But it seems like a, these days, broadcasters. I'm not I'm not sure because they do so many games and they're always like the high profile games and stuff like that. I think that they have a lot of scrutiny. I think like uh, Joe Buck gets this a lot, you know, he's, he's, he's always there and people just, you know, he's there so long and 
when when something goes against their team, like he's seen as the person that's kind of gloating or celebrating or, you know, I'm not sure. It's like, it's kind of hard to be an announcer these days. Um, but I always thought he was great. He did. He actually uh, retired from national broadcasting actually went back to St. Louis and was doing some regional broadcasting. Uh, there was talk, there was some talk that he was going to come back because, um, uh, there's a, a Cardinals broadcaster. Unfortunately, he, uh, he has, let's just say that he has problems and, and he, 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 he got his third strike, let's just say. Um, but he was teamed with, uh, uh his name was Dan, Dan McLaughlin. And, uh, he was great with him. And I thought they, 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 they paired each other, uh, really nice. Uh, but he actually retired um, due to health problems in, in 20, 2022. So, um, yeah, uh, this is he's, he was great. Any, anybody else remember him? Um, well, I, you can also mention that you can call him the Hall of Famer for his time as a broadcaster because he is a recipient of, I'm sorry to say his name, Jack, the Ford C. Frick Award, which they give to a broadcaster, you know, to be recognized as more or less a Hall of Famer. They do one of those, I believe, every year. You know, yeah, yeah. That name, Jack. don't get all offended, right? I, I'm offended, I'm triggered, dude. I know. Uh, so do you, do you think that, uh, like announcers, it's kind of they've kind of fallen off? You don't have be like the regional announcers because it's baseball's become so national. I mean, you don't have like the Harry Carey and the Tim McCarver. You, I, I don't, we don't have a broadcaster that I know of here at the Diamondbacks, or I just. It, it's becoming more homogenized. It used to be kind of regional, right? Is that, yes. is that, is that part of it? Yeah. And, and, and also like these, these announcers though, like do like the game, you know, uh, the higher profile games, like he, him, uh, and, and I'm trying to remember who else he was with, but they, they would always do the big broadcast, right? Mm-hmm. So they always are seen like that. Like it's like the Super Bowl, like whenever mm-hmm. it's, it's on there. Yeah. There's just seen as like that person is like, Oh, I like, uh, I remember when Brent Musburger, I remember like when I was growing up, Brent Musburger was like a guy who <clears throat> they always, people didn't like him only because they're like, Oh, he never says anything nice about my team or whatever. I'm just like, you know, it, 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 he's supposed to like, I don't know. It, it, they're supposed to be kind of neutral, but they're supposed to also like, you know, hype up the, the exciting things of the game. And, and uh, well, so they're kind of like a weird Tim, spot. Yeah. And that's why Tim is so well known because he was on a national platform for such a long time. I believe, you know, just doing Fox, like, playoff games and all that, you know, you're so heavily featured, you know, people knew that voice. I mean, if you go to the chat, uh, you know, I saw what Dutch is saying. It's like, yeah, he's, his voice is one of the voices of the baseball for sure in the last like 20, 30 mm-hmm. years, you know, because it's yeah, not, it's-, it's definitely changed over the years because back in the day you would have like in LA, we had Vin Scully Vince for the Scully. Dodgers and you're not going to have anything like this anymore because if someone gets too good, they're, a network's definitely going to snatch the guy and take him. You know, the, the era of a local broadcaster most likely being on 25, 30 years is not really going to be a thing anymore. And you can say that for every sport, probably. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Except yeah, for like the major market, because LA had announcers that were around for decades, you know, and New York, I believe, as well. Oh, that's interesting. Um, we had Tom Grieve uh, for the Rangers. Yeah. See, like uh, whenever there's home, you always have that home. Uh, I said, I, I, I know all the voices, uh, you know, when I listen on radio and TV and stuff like that. So, so one of, one of Tim McCarver's, uh, somebody criticized him one time, uh, this way, they said, when you ask him the time, um, he'll tell you how a watch works. (laughs) <laughs> like a good broadcaster should. Exactly. I mean, exactly. I mean these these games go long. You gotta you gotta right. like vamp. <laughs> well, I, so also like people would listen to baseball games on the radio. That's probably not happening a lot a lot these days. I mean, yeah. you could watch it on your phone. So the audio aspect isn't as important now. I mean, it's gonna depend on what market you're in. I mean, they're still like if you have like Sirius, they still have like. You can get almost every single game uh, uh, on like yeah. a Sirius X, a Sirius XM channel, huh. or I believe there's an MLB package where you can get any radio broadcast. It's you can, and they, they have, sometimes um, they'll have different ones, like they'll have like alternate ones as yes. well. So you know, like um, home team, the Spanish team, the right you know, away, exactly. you know, home away, and all that. It's like, oh, that's cool, you know. And it's at least you know that way you get every game as opposed to the you know the MLB package where you won't get your local team most likely. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, 
he brings up a, a really good a point here. The beauty of yeah. baseball, the games can go definitely long, and it's like you have to vamp and <laughs> just keep yeah. telling stories. That's why Vin Scully was so amazing. He just tells stories, you know, during yeah. the whole thing, and, and uh, that's that's a great point. So he was a three-time uh, sports Emmy Award winner, as you mentioned, a 2012 Ford C. Frick Award winner. Uh, so he's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. But did you know this? Did you know this? Uh, do you know what this is? It uh, looks like a really bad neighborhood karaoke. <laughs> He's actually in the Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. So for those who don't know, um, and this this is if if COVID took away one business, uh, it's one business too much, but it actually killed this. Uh, this is Foley's in New York. So the Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame was in the back of this pub, mm -hmm. and um, it's no longer there. I, I, it's actually, I think it's right across the street from like the Empire State Building, if I'm not mistaken. And I always wanted to go here, and um, this place looks awesome. And oh, I love that there's it says you can't sing Danny Boy there, <laughs> 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 which is a nice little touch. But yes, but yes, um, but the pub's still open. Is that correct? Um, I I, I, it says permanently closed. I think that oh, it shut down. Know. It said, and actually on their Twitter, it says we used to sell beer or we used to, oh, yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. So That's I think true. it is. I, gone. Didn't know about that. I did not know about that place. Otherwise I would have stopped by that for sure. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was so hyped out. I'm like, Oh, what is this? I got to go see this. And then it's no longer yeah. there anymore. Oh, so unfortunately, but, um, uh, Tim McCarver, rest in power. Uh, definitely, um, definitely, uh, we'll definitely miss you. And, uh, yeah, so I definitely want to celebrate it. It's one of the worst segments we do, but sometimes one of the most fulfilling that we get to talk about, uh, the great people in baseball. So this is where we are on all the socials. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, and TikTok. Uh, I know Angelo, you had an announcement as well that you wanted to talk about. Yes, I do. And it, uh, I will talk about Rip and Review, but my announcement um, is that uh, today uh, this show is going to be my last live podcast for a little bit. So I'll be taking a brief sabbatical. I will be back. Don't worry. Uh, but I know we've mentioned it on the show here a couple times in passing. But um, in about six or seven weeks, I'll be packing up and relocating my family to the great state of Texas. And um, there's just a lot going on and happening right now. We're uh, going to be closing escrow on our dream home in about four weeks. Um, so a lot of moving parts, uh, but um, a lot, a lot going on, a lot on my plate. So I want, I needed to uh, step away just for a little bit to uh, handle family business, but I will be back to this family um, uh, pretty soon. And, uh, but the rip and review videos will still continue. So this Saturday, you can tune in to uh, see me open up some 2023 Tops Baseball Series 1. Um, and then uh, look out for some uh, other videos coming in the future. Um, I did a um, uh, another vlog at a card show. I attended the Burbank Card Show um, in Ontario, California uh, last weekend. So I have a, a vlog of my experience there. Um, so Rip and Review will still be happening every Saturday morning, premiering at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, but uh, this will be my last uh, live podcast for a while, but I'll be back uh, sometime in May uh, likely is when, when I'll be able to jump back on and I'll be, I'll be moving to uh, North Texas, the Dallas area, Dutch. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and the beautiful thing is I'll have uh, my own, I guess, quote unquote studio um, and have my own setup. So uh, I'll be back um, better um, and uh, with better equipment and uh, some really, really cool stuff coming in the pipe. So appreciate Angelo, it. Thank can you, guys. Can I, please, can I please do one thing? Angelo, you're going to be coming back much like WrestleMania 3. You ready? Bigger! Better! Better! <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Love it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he's raising Dallas. Right on. Awesome. Nice. <clears throat> go Cowboys. So, uh, cowboy, you won't be the only cowboy in town anymore. That's right. I'm gonna. I'll. I'll have to trade the hat to you, brother. <laughs> You'll fit right in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kevin, uh, Jack, any last words? 
I would just want to say, everybody in the chat, thank you so much for joining us live. If you're watching us, please hit that like and subscribe button. It's just a small little click for you, but it means a whole lot to us. We appreciate you guys. We're here every week. This is this is the diamond exchange, the crown jewel of craft beer and baseball. We're, we're hitting you with old baseball, new baseball, craft beer reviews, and pop culture references that uh, that would make your head spin. So please like, subscribe, join us, check us out. We appreciate you being here, and uh, we'll catch you next time. And Cowboy Jack, how much does it cost to subscribe to our channel? Nothing. Wow. It's free. We're making Jerry Lee Lewis proud in this Jerry Lee Lewis never-ending telethon. And since we didn't go – let's and to close out, let's plug it one more time – Written review is dropping uh, 6 a.m. Pacific on this coming Saturday. And Angelo, what are you opening? 2023 Top Series 1 Baseball. Let's go. Yes. Ooh, that's going to be a longer video, too. It's a full cake, full box. Uh, not a hobby. I did a blaster. But, uh, blaster. but yeah, right. it was definitely a fun rip. And I uh, did a detailed breakdown and review of the, the card design this year. Oh, uh, so, cool. yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. Right on. So we'll see you next Tuesday with another Baseball Brew Crew podcast. Thanks for joining, everyone. Good night.